Now, you all know I'm not from uh, around here, right? Hey, don't be laughing. Um, <clears throat> who won and who lost against Penn State? Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. One, one who's tickled by that. Uh, you know, when we, when we first moved up to Michigan and I heard the term youper, I thought it was some kind of a fish that I'd never heard of, you know, like grouper or whatever. I'm going to need some help with this message this morning. So if, do we have any youpers in the house? We got a couple. All right. Uh, very good. I, I, I'm just going to have to have some help with, with this message. Uh, so you're a youper, eh? Eh? Yeah? Yeah, I got that one. Um, so... Are there a lot of ways to get up to the UP? Uh, I, I mean, there, there's got to be a lot of ways. I mean, I, I've learned that Michigan is like, uh, uh, there's a lower peninsula, right? And we're on it right now. Is that right? Uh, stay with me here. So there's a lower peninsula, peninsula and then there's an upper peninsula. And there's got to be, uh, Michigan's a pretty big state, right? So there's lots of ways to get up to the UP, right? There, there's not lots of ways. Like there's lots of bridges uh, across, right, into the UP. You can go. Well, you know, what if you're allergic to cheese? What, how, you know, I, uh, no, no, I'm saying from Michigan, from the Lower Peninsula, there's got to be a lot of ways to get up into the UP. No, uh, like there's lots of bridges, right? No, how many bridges are there? One? Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, that sounds very narrow, doesn't it? I mean, that kind kind of sounds really exclusive, doesn't it? Like you only got one way if you want to drive across the, into the UP, and that's what the the Mackinac Island Bridge or Mackinac Bridge. Yeah, see, uh, when I first saw that, it's like Mackinac. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not from around here when you say, uh, Ma I'm going up to Mackinac. <laughs> it only took like 20 times for me to find it sink in. You know, okay, that C is somehow pronounced like a W. Man, that's just weird. <laughs> just do it. You know, bridges, uh, how, how many of you got wet coming here this morning on your way to church? Did any of you cross any bridges to get here and, and you didn't get wet? How many of you are grateful for bridges? I mean, if you've ever had to ford a river, uh, either on foot or in a vehicle, you, you probably have come to appreciate bridges. Uh, they're not just functional, uh, you know, uh, meaning they keep us from getting wet. They help us to get places faster, right? But uh, some of them have become really iconic. I mean, you think of like the Golden Gate Bridge, right? That's really iconic. And then some states even put bridges on their license plates. Yeah. Uh, when I got the license plate for my motorcycle, I said, what bridge is that? <laughs> Ooh. It's true. You know, we got my, the motorcycle not long after we moved here, and I was like, what, what bridge is that? Uh, that's the Mackin Mackinac <laughs> Bridge. <laughs> no, the Mackinac Bridge. And if you're military-minded, right, uh, then you know that bridges are uh, very strategic, especially in battle. If you control the bridge, uh, you control the battle. And try to take the bridge, and you pay a really heavy price. You all probably have heard the story. September 1944, the Allies are attempting a daring invasion from Belgium into the Netherlands, into German-occupied Netherlands, and into northern Germany. In order to do that, they had to take several bridges and hold them. And so it was the largest airborne drop in all of World War II, even bigger than D-Day. And they called this operation, Operation Market Garden. And some of you know this story, and there was even a movie made about it entitled A Bridge Too Far. They bit off more than they could chew, and so uh, the, the operation uh, really failed simply because 
they could not hold the bridges long enough. Yeah, for a lot of reasons, bridges are important. You know what else is important besides bridges? Truth. Truth is important. And we're continuing in this series uh, full of it, grace and truth. And Jesus was full of it. And we need to be full of it too. I mean, look at the person next to you again and ask them again, are you full of it? Come on now. Are you full of grace and truth? Now, remember, Mark is playing the good cop. He's talking all about grace. He's Mr. Popular, uh, getting all those sermons on grace. And uh, Dave is the bad cop, Mr. Stick in the Mud. He gets all the sermons on truth, right? Thank you for not agreeing with me on that. Well, guess what, folks? Grace and truth both come from the same source, a God who loves us. So why do people find truth to be so offensive today? True speech and hate speech are one and the same to many people. Truth's unpopularity has caused many of us to clam up or to preach a grace gospel that says you're okay just the way you are. We would all agree that bridges are important because they get us to the other side. They keep us from getting all wet and even from drowning. Well, guess what? So does truth. Our goal is to love truth as much as we love grace because without truth, none of us will reach the other side. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. First, if we're to truly love truth, we must know that there is a strategy to dethrone truth. That's right. There's a strategy, and it's been in place since the Garden of Eden. And uh, there's been a plot afoot to destroy truth. Satan's strategy is to dethrone truth and to detour your faith. And it's a four-step process. Check it out. The Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, the question by the serpent to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The implication is that uh, God's not fair and God doesn't care. And so the uh, the first strategy, part of the strategy is to question truth and then just flatly deny truth. And he says, uh, you, when, when, when they were told about, remember the, the fruit from the tree, you know, or the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat it, you're going to die. That's what God said. But what did Satan, the serpent, say? He said, you will not certainly die. Just a flat-out denial of, of truth. And then there comes the substitute. The substitute to that. And, 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 he, and Satan says, in fact, you're not going to die. You will be like God, knowing uh, good and, uh, you know, knew, knowing what's right and wrong and so forth. You're going to be like God. And, and man has been in a quest to be like God since the Garden of Eden. And so we substitute. And then the next thing that happens is kill. So we question We deny, we substitute, and we kill. And we see the first murder takes place when Brother Cain kills his brother Abel. Imagine how grieved Adam and Eve must have been to see their two children. One kill his brother. And we see death come in the world uh, with Abel. Move on to the New Testament and Jesus' trial on Good Friday. Uh, The question was, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. Now, in in my text, I think I put Mark, uh, maybe maybe it's not there, but Mark 15. If you have that, mark it out, put Mark 14, 61 and 62. But the question was, are you uh, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus says, I am. And the the high priest, you see them in the Pharisees, they they rip their clothes and they say, uh, you've heard the blasphemy. You've heard the blasphemy. They denied that Jesus was the Son of God. And then before Pilate, you see what happens where Pilate wants to release Jesus, but uh, instead, instead, 
the crowd cried out to release Barabbas, a guy named Barabbas. And later on, uh, in, in other words, they allowed a murderer to go free in the place of the Son of God. Think about that. They let a, a murderer go free in place of the Son of God. So they substitute someone else. And then, of course, they killed Jesus. In Acts chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15, the apostle Peter is preaching, and he said, you killed the author of life, and you disowned, you, you disowned and you killed the author of life, and you asked that a murderer go free. That's what Peter said. You killed the author of life and asked for a murderer to go free. How messed up is that? And so we see again that pattern uh, of Satan, that strategy to dethrone truth in that four-part scheme of question, deny, substitute, kill. Now let's move to present day. Question. Did you really promise to be faithful to your husband or your wife for as long as you both shall live? I mean, that's so exclusive. That, that cramps, that just cramps my style. That's just not the way we roll today. And then we deny. My wife will, or my husband will never find out. <laughs> They'll never find out. My wife knows <laughs> the minute I've ever have done so. What'd you do? What'd you do? Then we substitute. Another woman for the, the man or vice versa. Because we think that they'll never find out. <laughs> and then lastly, the kill. The wife finds out in the marriage and the husband are both dead or vice versa. Uh, I love uh, Garth Brooks. One of my favorite songs is uh, Papa Loved Mama. And uh, boy, country music just gets to the heart of the matter really well, <laughs> don't they? Uh, I think Garth Brooks wrote this, Papa loved Mama, Mama loved men, Mama's in the graveyard, Papa's in the pen. And if you, if you haven't heard that song, it's pretty good. But, well, no, not really. Uh, Papa used his semi-truck to drive it through the motel where his wife was with the other man. And you see the family is destroyed. Strategy to dethrone truth has been in place since the very beginning, since, since, uh, since the Garden of Eden. And it's to question, deny, substitute, and kill. But what's Satan's end game? Satan's end game is to destroy truth and to detour your life. To detour your life. And to do that, he's going to say there are many paths to truth. And that truth is whatever we want it to be today. But is that what the Bible teaches? So if we're going to love the truth, we have to understand that there's an enemy of truth seeking to dethrone truth and to detour your life and that Jesus is the only bridge of grace and truth. When you look at the Bible, what do you see? Let's think about that for a minute. You look at this Bible, what exactly do you see? Um, you might say, well, I, I, I see 39 books in, in the Old Testament. Let me try to get us on center. Or the, Yeah, right here. So I see 39 books in, in the Old Testament, and I see 27 books in, in the New Testament. I see 66 books in all, and a lot of names that I can't pronounce. <laughs> right, right, we say that. Uh, you know, some books make a lot of sense to me, and, 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 and then there's some books that, boy, I find a little hard to understand. And I hear, you know, in, in here there's some really crazy stories. There's, there's one about a flood and a floating zoo, right? There, there's another one about a, a little boy who kills a, like a nine-foot giant with a, a rock, a slingshot, right? Uh, there's all kinds of stories in here that, that are just really, well, amazing or 
Some people might say far-fetched, right? But when you look at the Bible, what images come to mind? Well, that could really open a Pandora's box, couldn't it, of visual images. Anywhere from a cosmic grandpa sitting in a rocking chair, uh, remaining aloof from the world that supposedly he created, just completely out of touch with all that's going on. Or if you're into the Lord of the Rings, any of you watch those movies, right? You see, you see this eye that's that great eye, Sauron, uh, and it's looking to and fro, seeking control and to manipulate mankind. I'm not talking about these. When you look at the book, when you look at God's word, do you see God's plan to redeem humanity culminating in Jesus and then God's eternal plan to redeem us? You know, when I read this book, I see an hourglass of sorts. You all know what an hourglass is. That's kind of an old, there it is, kind of an hourglass uh, of sorts. What do I mean by that? Well, let me go into a little bit of a story. Uh, on the day that Jesus Christ arose, you remember that? Um, he appear, appeared to Mary Magdalene. And then the Bible says that there were two of the disciples. One of them was Clopas, uh, Cleopas. And there's another one of those words, hard, uh, names hard to, under, to pronounce. And there were two uh, disciples going on their way to a village called Emmaus. Now, it was seven miles from Jerusalem. Stay with me here. They're walking on that first Sunday afternoon to a village called Emmaus. And as they're walking along, they're really sad. They're really confused and, and, and the whole bit. And so as they're walking along, this fellow comes up beside them, says, How you doing, guys? And they said, Not good. Are you the only one here in Jerusalem parts that doesn't know what's happened? In these last few days, well, tell me what's happened. And they said, don't you know that Jesus, we thought that he was uh, sent from God, but the Jews, together with the Romans, they crucified him, and then they buried him, and then it's been three days, and some women came from the tomb and said that he had risen. And Jesus begins right there, and the Bible says that, that he, 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 started, he started talking to them. Now, they were kept hidden from knowing who he was, but Jesus started all the way back with Moses and the law and went through the prophets, the Old Testament, proving that the Son of God had to suffer and rise from the grave. They got to Emmaus, to, to the village where they were going, and, and uh, they went in, and, and, and they ate, and Jesus broke bread, and he blessed it, and then their eyes were opened, and they said, weren't our hearts burning? And then Jesus uh, vanished from sight. Now, why do I share that story with you? It's because there in Luke chapter 24, uh, we see Jesus taking the Old Testament, Taking the Old Testament, beginning with the first five books of Moses, uh, the Pentateuch, and then going through all of the prophets and proving that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It's as if all of history funneled down to this one moment in time where Jesus Christ was crucified. It's a funnel leading to a single bridge, and that bridge is the truth of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the only Savior of the world. And so all of the cultures and everybody that lived on the earth, all the way to that moment, all the way to that moment, saw Jesus Christ 
as the Savior of the world. Now, did Jesus say that? That he is the only Savior of the world? Well, in John chapter 9, Jesus said, I am the gate. In Matthew 7 and verse 8, he said, I am the door. In John 15 and verse 1, he said, I'm the true vine. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, uh, the Apostle Paul says that there's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, we could give a whole bunch more. But Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Kind of like the state of Michigan, there's the LP. Do you call it that? You get the lower, why do we call the UP, the upper peninsula UP and not call the lower peninsula the LP? It's a record. The LP is gas and it's a record. Well, full of gas, is that? So we know, uh, uh, okay, no. All right, so uh, th there's a lower peninsula, peninsula and there's the upper peninsula, and there's one bridge across it. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the truth is, is that Jesus Christ is that bridge of grace and truth and through which we cross over from death to life. Now, if Jesus is the bridge then we're called to be a truth lover, a truth lover. Now, once we cross over the bridge from death to life, we're free to go off anywhere and everywhere we want, right? Is that right? We say, I'm free. Now, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the word, road that leads to life, and only a few find it, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Therein lies the purpose of the New Testament. The purpose of the New Testament is to teach us how to stay on that narrow path, the road to life, and how to love like Jesus, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Is it easy? What do you think? No. Do we need to be full of grace and full of truth? Who gives us uh, the energy, the wisdom to walk this way and to love truth? It's the Holy Spirit who lives within us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 said, People perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. You hear that? People perish because they refuse to what? Love the truth and so be saved. The Message Bible adds that those who refuse to love the truth are banished to a chosen world of lies and illusions. Kind of like that one where <laughs> that husband or wife says, my wife will never find, my husband says, my, my wife is never going to find out. Pilate, the Roman governor who sentenced Jesus to death, and asked the question that we all must ask, what is truth? Each one of us come to, uh, come to a time in our lives where we have to ask that question that Pilate asked, what is truth? Pilate actually had the opportunity to stare right in the eyes of truth. As he, uh, as he looked at Jesus and asked that question, well, since we're seeking truth today, I have a confession to make. You know, that hourglass illustration, it's flawed. It is, it's flawed. Why? Why is it flawed? Well, 
It's not flawed that Jesus is the bridge through which uh, those who believe have crossed over from death into life. No, it's flawed for a very important reason. It's because it gives us the illusion of time in equal parts. What do I mean by that? Francis Chan use this illustration, I think it's so accurate. Picture this rope being your life. Let's say you lived 100 years on this earth. That would be 36,500 days. Add in some leap years, right? But give or take. What would 100 years be in comparison to eternity? Talked about Jesus being a bridge. Let's go back here. There's a point at which all of us have to decide what is truth. And the answer to that question determines eternity. How long is eternity? God said... God's Word says that uh, to God a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years a day. How important are bridges? This morning, we're going to offer an invitation. Because, brothers and sisters, we don't want anybody to spend an eternity without Jesus in their life. What is hell? Where Jesus is not. Jesus is not. If you haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, there's a bridge waiting for you. And it begins by asking that question, what is truth? The truth is, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is our Lord and Savior. Will you accept Him as your Lord and Savior this morning? We're going to stand and sing. If you have a decision to make concerning that relationship with Jesus Christ, that eternal relationship, we invite you to come. Let's stand. Let's